We welcome you again to our study on the prophet who saw things hundreds of years, even thousands of years before they are going to come to pass. And we are in this period of the book of Isaiah when he is talking about God's judgments upon the nations. We have seen previously concerning his judgments on Ethiopia, Moab, Ammon and Edom. But now we come to a very powerful nation, if I could say this, in the history of mankind, and that is Egypt. Now, Egypt is a very interesting country. Egypt is the land of death. All their monuments speak of death. Those great pyramids, those great pyramids that were one of the seven wonders of the world and in fact the only wonder of amongst those seven that have remained unto this day those pyramids but what are those pyramids those pyramids are tombs to the dead tombs to their passing kings and the treasure of Egypt is really the treasures of death. Well, we know from the history of Egypt how indeed God brought Abraham down and then later on Joseph and Jacob down into the land of Egypt and there they were suckered for about 400 years, 430 years to be precise. And uh, then... God with mighty signs and wonders brought up his people from Egypt through the ten plagues. Those ten plagues were judgments against the gods that Egypt worshipped. For example, one god was the god Re, the sun god. And one of the plagues was to have the sun darkened as God's sign and judgment that he was breaking the power of that. God because when God brought up the children of Israel from Egypt the judgment was not just against Pharaoh who had hardened his heart and God indeed had hardened Pharaoh's heart too against his will and against his desires so that God might bring forth the plagues but in bringing forth those plagues God made it very clear his judgments were not just against the Egyptians but against those angelic fallen angels that indeed Egypt worshipped well as we look into the Old Testament we find time and time again you know that Egypt, uh, Egypt which had been the home to the children of Israel and God had brought them out and God had caused the Egyptians to plague his people and cause them to suffer so that they cried out to God oh God, you know, deliver us from the Egyptians and God under Moses delivered them but you know, in spite of the fact that they had cried out to God to be delivered from Egypt and had cried out to God you know, that he would bring them into the promised land yet do you know even through the wilderness and even when they're in the promised land and they were in trouble they turned to Egypt for help what does Egypt represent spiritually well Egypt represents this world you know Pharaoh who was the king of Egypt the ruler of Egypt he had in his crown a serpent and therefore he was a type of the prince of this world a serpent Satan we are told in Ezekiel that the end of Egypt is in the nether parts of the world in other words hell is the end of Egypt and hell as we well know is in the earth when people die without Christ they go into the depths of hell where are you going when you die 
You know, without Christ, you'll be going down into the nether parts of the earth. And that's what Ezekiel says concerning Pharaoh and concerning his hordes and concerning the Egyptians. He said their end is in the nether parts of the earth. They are a type of the people of this world, a type of people who do not know Christ. Their end is in hell. Well, we now come to chapter 19, the burden of Egypt. And Isaiah depicts with such accuracy much of the history of Egypt. He speaks of the Egyptians against the Egyptians, which was a historical fact that occurred around 500 BC. But also, he gives a very remarkable promise to Egypt. And Egypt is a mixture because Egypt you know when I went there first time and I had to speak to pastors in Egypt uh, about six million in Egypt claimed to be Christians amongst the population something like 50 million and uh, I wanted to know how I was going to open up the seminar which I was one of the speakers and uh, the Lord brought me back to a very interesting historical event and uh, at the birth of Christ there was Herod who sought to kill Christ an angel came to Joseph and said arise take the baby and take the mother into Egypt for there I will sustain you until the death of Herod. And so, there Christ and indeed Joseph and Mary were sustained for a time until the death of Herod. And then afterwards, they were told to come back and there they stayed at Nazareth where he grew up but uh, the Lord spoke to me you know when I was going to speak to these pastors in Egypt he said I've never forgotten how Egypt took care of my son and in fact when you go to Egypt you know just north of Cairo there is if I could say this a place where they say the Holy Family stayed so Egypt is in a sense a mixture it is a people that have rebelled against God in fact in the prophecy of Zechariah speaking of the millennial reign of Christ upon earth it says those nations that are in the millennium who do not come to the feast of tabernacles and worship the Lord in Jerusalem shall have no reign Then he speaks expressly of Egypt as being one of those that shall rebel in the time of the millennium and shall have no reign. So there you have the thought, well, Egypt, yes, has blessed the family of God, but also it's a nation that does rebel against God too. But... Looking now at uh, chapter 19, we see a very remarkable statement concerning Egypt. And uh, in uh, verse 21, and in verse 19, and also verse 23, we see remarkable promises for Egypt. Let's look at verse 19. In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord, in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord do you know that the Jewish Bible that is the Old Testament was translated into Greek and it was translated in the land of Egypt called the Septuagint version and it was quoted by Christ 
And there was a large Jewish population that worshipped the Lord in the land of Egypt in the time of Ptolemy. Well, we go on and in verse 21 it says, The Lord shall be known in Egypt and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day and shall sacrifice, make oblations to him. And so there you have the thought that in the land of Egypt in the Old Testament times the Lord was worshipped. So there was a, if I could say this, a part of the nation that turned to the Lord. And then look what it says here in uh, verse 22, But God shall smite the Egyptians. He shall smite and heal it. In other words, God says, you know, the Egyptians, for their perverseness and their rebellion, are going to be judged of me. But then he said, I will heal. And look at this remarkable scripture. In verse 23, In that day there shall be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrians shall come unto Egypt, the Egyptians, yes, unto Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians and verse 24 and in that day shall Israel be a third with Egypt and Assyria even a blessing in the midst of the land and look at this verse 25 whom the Lord of hosts shall say blessed be Egypt my people Assyria the work of my hands and Israel, mine inheritance. Very remarkable prophecy that. And you see, I quoted that, and as I looked at these dear Egyptian pastors who have suffered so much in their country because the Christians have laws against them, they can only rise so high in government they cannot have the freedom that the Muslims have in that land and as I looked at these dear Egyptian pastors this scripture came to me blessed be Egypt my people and they smiled do you know afterwards they gave me a little gift and that little gift had this scripture Blessed be Egypt, my people. And so you see what a mixture there is there. It's like many of the Western nations, like many nations in the world. There are those who want God with all their hearts and will be blessed. And the other part, like is true of Egypt, that they will be judged. Part rebellious, heart worshipping God and we've got to be in the right part you know in our own countries whichever country I'm speaking to now you know why don't you make an altar to the Lord why don't you worship him in your country like these dear believers did in Egypt they worship the Lord amongst the heathen and God remembered them mightily well in chapter 20 it refers to God's judgment upon the unbelieving part of Egypt and it speaks of this other nation that we've already mentioned the Assyrians and now we're looking at another part of the history of of the world because Isaiah you know flows backwards and forwards with prophetic easements across the millennia so he, he's been speaking of the millennial reign of Christ when Egypt shall be called the people of God and now in chapter 20 he's going back 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 into history and he's speaking of the times that are shortly to come even in his own lifetime when the Assyrians will be raised up by God to punish 
not only Israel but also Egypt and so chapter 20 is devoted to the fact that Assyria will be used by God to judge Egypt it's interesting you know as we consider the last days that speaking of Egypt the Antichrist shall come against Egypt because the Egyptians shall not accept the Antichrist and uh, yet the Antichrist shall prevail over them so again you see what a mixture there is in Egypt and uh, you're going to see that in many nations of the world well I want to move on to chapter 21 and here again in chapter 21 the prophet reverts to his previous prophecies in chapter 13 and 14 concerning Babylon and uh, the theme of this is essentially his judgment God's judgment upon Babylon and uh, a scripture that is quoted even in the book of Revelation and verse 9 I'm speaking now in chapter 21 and verse 9 of Isaiah that he said Babylon is fallen is fallen Babylon is fallen is fallen you know it's uh, a scripture that's quoted many times and there's a reason for it because you see when Babylon arises again as the seat of the Antichrist people will not indeed believe and understand that this city can possibly be brought down it will seem as though the Antichrist is omnipotent that nothing can withstand evil but God wants us to know and realize this that Babylon although it be a great city in the last days the capital of the Antichrist he indeed will bring it down he indeed will bring it down God has his periods when he raises up evil for the purpose of bringing judgment upon the wicked but it's only for a time it doesn't last forever you think you know of that uh, scripture in Proverbs where it says the crown doth not last forever have we not seen you know throughout the history of mankind empires rising empires falling have we not seen the Turkish empire you know rise to great heights to be brought down in the early 1900s the British empire that covers the world you know ended in about 1960 you see in other words what I'm saying is this that God has his times when empires rise and empires fall and it's all in the purpose of God God controls everything but you see at times it seems that when one is looking at current events that it would seem impossible things would change and so in a very real sense God repeats throughout his word this promise that Babylon will fall Babylon will fall the city of confusion will be brought down and what is important to understand is this that your enemy in your own life who seems to be so triumphant you can trust God bring that enemy down in due time when that enemy has done his work or her work in your life and you have been sanctified and you have been seeking God oh God purify me oh God hear my voice oh God deliver me from my enemy and when you are truly sanctified and purified and purged from the thing that God is dealing with you in your life then God removes the enemy because the enemy is raised up only for a purpose 
and that is to purify God's people and accomplish God's will and when they have accomplished God's will he takes them away so let us be encouraged well we move on and uh, in chapter 22 it speaks of the day of trouble upon Jerusalem and now he reverts back you see you know well there's going to be trouble for Jerusalem through the Babylonians but he's already told them that Babylon will fall so what he's saying is this look Babylon are my sanctified ones Babylon are the people I've raised up to judge you and to purify you and he said it will be a day of trouble because you're not walking with me and uh, you know Jerusalem prepared you know for a siege in verse 11 they prepared for war they dug ditches they prepared their water supply and uh, they thought that they would be alright but look you know their attitude uh, you know God says when I bring the enemy against you he said to purify you in verse 12 in that day did the Lord God of hosts call for weeping mourning boldness girding with sackcloth and he said when you saw the enemy what was your attitude and here it is in verse 13 behold joy and gladness slaying oxen killing sheep eating flesh drinking wine and they did eat and drink for they said for tomorrow we shall die in other words there was no repentance you see and that is the problem you know people can see the danger and yet they don't realize this is the hand of God coming against their nation or coming against themselves and God calling upon them to repent no they say oh let us eat and drink for tomorrow we shall die and God says that sin will never be purged you see our attitude in times of judgment is very important indeed and uh, so then he speaks concerning two people Shebna a treasurer a minister of God high position in the uh, government of Hezekiah at the time and he said oh I should be here forever and he said I will have a wonderful tombstone here and carve me out a tomb in the mountain he said here is my rest forever God said oh God said because of your unfaithfulness and because you have not you know carried out your ministry faithfully he said I'm going to cast you out into a far country and you'll be tossed to and fro violently like one throws a ball and then he said I'm going to replace you by a person who is faithful and his name is Eliakim and he said I will give him the responsibility to be a father to the people in Jerusalem and uh, I want to bring this to a close if I might say considering these two people you see Shebna who had a position who was entrusted with great responsibility and yet was unfaithful was removed and God does remove the unfaithful ministers of God God does remove unfaithful rulers and he replaces them with those who are shepherds after his own heart and this Eliakim was apparently a very wonderful and godly man and uh, I want to consider him just for a moment or two because he is a picture of what God wants each one of us to be as we mature he is depicted as one who bears the burden of people bears a responsibility for looking after them and he is called a father you know what is your concept of a father the concept of a father is one that you go to in time of
trouble, one who cares for you, one who guides you, one who instructs you, and one who indeed so loves you, that corrects you if you go astray. Well, this is what God wants us to be. You know, understanding all the things that are coming upon the earth, understanding why God judges nations, why some nations, the godly nations, are judged by very wicked nations, only that they would be purged and purified and would be ripe to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then, those nations that have been used by him to bring judgment upon the godly in the time when their ministry is finished, then God not only judges them, judges them, but removes them entirely. And, uh, you know, God wants ministers who can care for people, explain to people the ways of God, so that in these times of trouble, these times of turbulence, times of torment, you know, God will have faithful people who will be like fathers, mothers in Israel to the younger ones so that we can strengthen them and through knowledge and wisdom make them stable in the times of darkness that are coming upon the earth. So I want to say to you, be like Eliakim, not like Shebna, who was given the position but was not faithful. Let us be faithful ministers of Christ to care for the people and to guide them and to make them strong and stable in the times that are to come. May God bless you. Amen.